Good evening and welcome to the Company Shops Railroad Club uh, monthly presentation for January of 2024. Uh, my name is Dutch Tubman and I am going to do this evening's presentation uh, titled the East Broadtop Rail and Coal Company Narrow Gauge Survivor in the Pennsylvania Appalachians. In the fall of 2023, I made the drive to Orbisonia, Pennsylvania to repeat something I had not done in 20 years, namely taking a ride on the narrow gauge railroad that almost didn't make it into the 21st century. The East, Top, East Broad Top Railroad and Coal Company is the largest surviving narrow gauge railroad in the eastern United States. And Basically, it's going to go from the top of the screen up here at Mount Union, and it is going to go 33 miles south to Robertsdale, and then two miles south of there. It was originally built to run from Robertsdale northwards to a connection with the Pennsylvania Railroad at Mount Union, PA, a distance of 33 miles. The story of the East Broadtop is the story of coal mining in the Broadtop Mountain coal field. Mining in this region dates back to colonial times, but took off in earnest in 1872 with the establishment of the East Broadtop Coal and Railroad. As barely shown on the above map, the Broadtop Mountain coal field was a small and isolated deposit of high quality, smokeless coal located east of the far larger bituminous coal deposits in the west of the state. So this huge area of yellow or green over here in western Pennsylvania, if you go directly east you see this small little patch of, of green and that is the truly isolated broadtop mountain coal deposits. Uh, over here in eastern Pennsylvania is a commodity near and dear to my heart, the anthracite coal fields which are still very active today as are the bituminous fields in the western part of the state. But as I said, our focus tonight is going to be the Broadtop Coal Mountain region. The East Broadtop Coal and Railroad Company, and we'll refer to it as the EBTR, was established as a coal mining conglomerate with its own railroad. It was planned as a narrow gauge railroad to help it to help cut construction costs and help it navigate some tight curves as it crosses two separate mountain ranges. Construction of the EBTR commenced in 1872 in the newly constructed borough of Robertsdale, which was also the operating headquarters for the coal mining operations. The EBTR opened for business between Rock Hill and Mount Union on August 30th, 1873, and from Orbisonia to Robertsdale a month later. The EBTR locomotive number one is shown years later outside the station at Orbisonia, the railroad's operational headquarters. And by the way, Orbisonia station is actually located in the borough of Rock Hill and not in Orbisonia, which is a separate township nearby, but has a stream separating it from Rock Hill. The station was given the name Orbisonia by the EBTR so as to avoid confusing it with several other rail-served Rock Hills in the state of Pennsylvania. If you shipped a car to Rock Hill, Pennsylvania, there was a good chance it may not go to the right Rock Hill and somebody was going to end up paying for a diversion cost. So, we call it Orbisonia. The EBTR was originally built with 40-pound rail and local low-cost materials as shown by this early bridge over Pogue Creek. In conjunction with the start of large-scale mining in the Robertsdale area, the Rock Hill Iron and Furnace Company built a dual-stack coke-fired iron furnace for the production of pig iron in the town of Rock Hill. A dual-stack coke-fired iron furnace is pretty top-of-the-line metal-making facility. And this facility, including numerous coking ovens, took advantage of an existing iron furnace in Rock Hill, which had been there really since colonial times, and of iron ore deposits located northeast of Rock Hill near Shade Gap, Pennsylvania. The East Broadtop Railroad made all this possible 
by providing transportation for the coking coal, the iron ore, and the finished pig iron. Less than 10 years after its opening in 1881, the EBTR's traffic was broken down between coal, roughly three quarters of the business, pig iron, the finished product from the iron making process, about 10 percent, and then the movement of iron ore, 13.4 uh, percent. So in the EBTR's first decade, almost half its business was in conjunction with the Rock Hill iron furnaces. This was to change completely within a couple of decades. The Rock Hill Iron Furnace remained the EBTR's biggest customer through the 19th century. In this photo, EBTR number one, which has now lost its cow catcher, is serving as a switch engine at the iron furnace. Daily operations on the East Broadtop. By the turn of the 20th century, the EBTR had established a daily except Sundays operating plan that stayed virtually unchanged until the 1950s. And if you can see my small um, little cursor here, uh, the trains left very early in the morning, 4.30, 5.30 in the morning. And what they did, the train started off in Rock Hill, which was the railroad's operational headquarters, and it basically picked up coal miners along the way, took them to Robertsdale, and later south to Alvin. Then that same uh, train turned around and went back to Rock Hill, stopped and continued on to Mount Union. Now, there was a lot of switching done in the interim. It was not a, uh, you know, they had a schedule, but I'm not sure how, uh, <laughs> how much they kept to it. Um, so... Basically, it was a series of trains that kind of went back and forth between Robertsdale, where the coal mines were, Rock Hill, where the railroad was, and Mount Union, where the Pennsylvania Railroad was. There was also a significant branch called the Shade Camp Branch, which we're going to discuss later. So, this is a timetable from 1899, and this timetable is pretty much going to stay the same with uh, less frequency into the 1950s. The EBTR passenger train shown here in Mount Union might seem like a typical small railroad local. Chances were very good, however, this same train would also pick up a number of empty hoppers for the return to the coal fields. This picture shows a typical northbound loaded EBTR train. In this case, 15 loaded cars followed by a combination coach slash cabin car uh, Cabooses in Pennsylvania are known as cabin cars for any passengers and the crew. It was no surprise that the Rock Hill Iron Furnaces were ultimately unable to compete with the giant steel and iron plants in western Pennsylvania. Subsequently, this facility was shut down in 1907. Thankfully for the EBTR, however, the growth of the refractory brick industry in Mount Union was able to supplant the lost traffic from Rock Hill. In a relatively short period of time, Mount Union, Pennsylvania had become the world's largest producer of silica brick, which is used to line industrial furnaces. You have an industrial furnace, you have a blast furnace where you're melting iron ore and coke and limestone to make steel and the temperature is going to go up into the thousands of degrees. You have to have this, this material, you have to have this uh, furnace lined with a very specific substance, in this case the silica brick, to act kind of as a buffer to the outer uh, rim of the iron furnace, and, but also something that's not going to crumble or burn. So it's a very special, silica brick, very specialized kind of commodity. There were three major refractories producing this commodity, all of whom were served by the EBTR. After 1900, most of the coal moving to the three refractories in Mount Union went to a large EBTR-served coal washing facility for processing the raw coal. This is a wonderful photograph here. If you look down here in the lower half, 
That is raw coal, and you can see the white lumps in it. That's rock. Uh, you, nobody wants to put rock into their steel furnace or iron furnace or wherever it's going to go into the coking process. So what happens is the coal has to go to this large building in the background here and get washed. And washing basically consists of pulverizing the coal and then separating the coal and the rock by using large ponds where the rock sinks and the coal rises to the surface and is skimmed off. The other wonderful thing about this photograph, and we're going to talk more about this later, notice the contrast in car types in this photo. So on the left hand side here you've got these narrow gauge coal cars. Looking over here you will see, but it's dual gauge track. The two outer rails are what we call standard gauge railroad, the same sort of uh, gauge we use today for the modern railroads of the United States. However, the East Broadtop was built to a narrow gauge railroad. So the narrow gauge railroad was actually the inner rail and the rail opposite the greater distance. So what we have in the middle track here is we have a standard gauge, two standard gauge railroad cars, a gondola and a, probably a Pennsylvania Railroad hopper car. You can't see it but the wheels are on the standard gauge. If we go over here, these are carloads of, these are narrow gauge carloads of ganister rock. Again, you can kind of almost clearly see the, uh, the coupler here on the end. It is a narrow gauge car and a narrow gauge track. It is overhanging the broad gauge, but it's not on it. So two types of narrow gauge equipment, one type of standard gauge. Not only did the Mount Union refractories use broadtop mountain coal for fueling their furnaces, the EBTR was used to transport mined ganister rock. Ganister rock is a quartzite sandstone used in the manufacture of silica brick. In this above photo, the northbound EBTR coal train on the right is making a stop at the small town of Saltillo to pick up carloads of ganister rock from the sock track on the left. That's actually a small inspection car, a speeder car in the middle. So the coal train will pull in. They know how many coal cars and how heavy their train is. They will pick up as much ganister rock as their coal train will hold and still allow just the present locomotive to operate it. And they would use that ganister rock to fill out the train. And this is a picture of Mountain Union Yard. As shown in the above photograph, some of the most, much of the East B, much, actually most of the EBTR trackage in Mountain Union was dual gauge for easy access by both standard gauge and narrow gauge cars. Truly a dual gauge carrier, the EBTR maintained two standard gauge switch engines in Mountain Union. Engine number three had been parked but out of service in the Mount Union engine house since 1960. There's presently a rumor on the internet that this, could, this locomotive has actually been um, sold to a railroad in Florida for display. So kind of unfortunate, um, but uh, since it would be the only remaining standard gauge EBTR locomotive, but there you go. So what was the golden age of the EBTR? We already talked about the fact that the EBTR in its first 30-some years was really dependent upon the Rock Hill iron furnaces. But when they switched over to the uh, uh, supplying the silica brick refractories in Mount Union, the decade between 1910 and 1920 was the heyday for the EBTR. Under the leadership of its president, Robert Seibert, the railroad purchased six new 2A2 Mikado class locomotives. They also replaced the remaining iron rail with heavier steel rail, as well as upgrading their rail car fleet from wood to steel construction. This locomotive is essentially a standard gauge locomotive on narrow gauge trucks. And you can see it's got, you know, when you, when you call it a 
two-way two. That means it has two wheels on either side of the track. Here you can see the four wheels here. There's another four over there, hence the eight. And there's one more wheel here with another corresponding wheel on the other side. It becomes a 282, Mikado class locomotive. This locomotive, which was built in 1918, was one of the largest narrow gauge engines ever built. And by the way, if you go to Orbisonia um, when the museum and the roundhouse is open, this locomotive is sitting up there undercover. During the same period, the EBTR upgraded its shops complex in Rock Hill, which allowed them to perform just about any task that the much larger Pennsylvania Railroad could also do in their nearby Altoona shops. Altoona is only about 50 miles away from Mount Union, but this amazing little railroad um, had set up their shops so they could do just about anything without having to send it to another railroad to be worked on. And we're going to take a little closer look at this workshop later on. The EBTR built a timber transfer. Now again, most of the, uh, most of the, the, by this time, most of their traffic is coal and ganister rock, but they are also doing a significant amount of, of, of timber, of logging, and what's happening is that the, uh, the logs are brought in from the countryside on narrow gauge cars, and transferred to standard gauge railroad cars for the E.L. McCreevy Lumber Company. And if you look here, you can see the, the overhead crane with a chain coming down off it. The chain has been put under a series of logs, and they're picking it up and moving it from a narrow gauge car to a standard gauge car. With the bankruptcy of McCreevy in the 1930, my guess is it was probably, that was probably related to the Depression, the timber transfer was no longer needed. Stuck with a facility it no longer needed, the EBTR devised a plan to repurpose the timber transfer. The timber transfer was pre-purposed into a facility that now transferred standard gauge railroad cars onto narrow gauge trucks as shown below. You can see there is a standard gauge car in the background. It has been jacked up. You could also put the, the chain under it and pull it up if you wanted to, but in this case it's jacked up. These guys are pushing the, um, the standard gauge truck on a standard gauge um, uh, track. They're getting it out of the way. They then bring a narrow gauge truck in. They push that underneath and carefully lower the railroad car onto the narrow gauge truck. This allowed the EBTR to do true interline traffic with the Pennsylvania Railroad Company. Um, there is a, uh, a picture which I don't have for the presentation, but the EBTR's uh, timetable in the official railway guide had a thing under there saying, free transfer of standard gauge uh, uh, railroad cars to our narrow gauge cars so your, your commodity does not have to be transloaded at no extra charge. Uh, EBTR was pretty plucky and tried to be as innovative as they could. The first traffic to benefit from this sort of innovation were carloads of road tar shipped to areas that were adjacent to highways, including the then under construction Pennsylvania Turnpike. Um, the story of the Pennsylvania Turnpike and its relation to railroads is really a presentation in itself. But I will say that the Pennsylvania Turnpike was built on the right-of-way of a railroad that was never built, but it was built to compete with the Pennsylvania Railroad and was stopped before they actually got around to putting tracks down. However, they graded it, they built tunnels and that. This all took place in the 1870s, 1880s. Forty years later, uh, when Pennsylvania decided to build the first turnpike, which I believe was modeled on the Jordan Autobahn, it so happened that the most inaccessible part of the Pennsylvania Turnpike, the only thing that came anywhere near it was the Shade Gap branch of the EBTR. So again, during this time, it, it, the Pennsylvania Turnpike was a very good customer for about a decade of the EBTR, after which time the Pennsylvania Turnpike then proceeded to trick traffic away 
from every railroad in the state of Pennsylvania. But as I say, that's another story. To facilitate this kind of traffic between standard and, and narrow gauge cars, the EBTR designed an aluminum compromise device that fit between the narrow gauge and the standard gauge couplers. This compromise device is actually on a standard gauge car that is on standard gauge trucks at Mount Union. So it can be actually moved up and down for a little ways. Um, <clears throat> but the coupler locations, what you want to do is you want to put the coupler location in the center of the car. A narrow gauge car is narrower than a standard gauge car. So the coupler, the two couplers are going to be kind of off kilter if you try to put a narrow gauge coupler up against a standard gauge coupler. This device, part, part of it was designed to fit to a narrow gauge coupler, other part to a standard gauge coupler. This allowed a uniform coupling between the two car types. In another effort to cut costs, the EBTR ordered parts from two different gas electric motor car producers and built their own narrow gauge passenger electric motor car to haul passengers and mail on Saturdays when they weren't running coal trains to Mount Union. So the coal mine only, the coal mine only operate five days a week, but the U.S. mail was a six-day-a-week operation. 1950s, beginning of the end of common carrier status. What do I mean by common carrier status? A railroad that is open to the public is what is known as a common carrier. If you have a commodity and you want the railroad to carry it, if you can come up with A, a car that you can carry the commodity in, and are B, willing to charge whatever the railroad will charge you, chances are very good you can get a rate on moving just about anything outside of skyscrapers or anything that's obviously way too big to to be moved on a railroad. Um, but so when we talk about the beginning of the end of the common carrier status, we're going to see that this is when the EBTR essentially goes out of business, it no longer carries freight or passengers. In this 19, April 28, 1952 EBTR timetable was still similar to the 1899 schedule that we saw earlier, but this was about to change. Again, if, I can, if you can see my, uh, my little cursor here, there's a train at 425 in the morning, goes out of Orbisonia, goes up to Robertsdale, drops the miners off. Later that morning, turns around, runs all the way to Mountain Union, maybe handles interchange cars there, comes back. at 3 o'clock and ties up in Rock Hill for that evening. So they're still running one through train to Mount Union and the commuter train. In early 1953, the EBTR canceled their scheduled passenger train service from Alvin and Robertsdale to Mount Union. Their mail contract, which was handled in the RPO section of the baggage car, was switched to an EBTR trucks, a move which was then canceled by the post office shortly afterwards. I hope the EBTR did not spend a lot of money going out and buying specialized trucks because whatever they bought it was not acceptable to the post office. For a while afterwards, passengers could ride with the crew in the caboose, but by 1954, the company had canceled its insurance and passengers were no longer allowed on the property. By the early 1950s, virtually all of EBTR's traffic was tied to hauling inbound ganister rock and coal and fuel coal to the three brick refractories in Mount Union. With the end of the Korean War, demand for silica fire brick plummeted, and the general refractories plant one of the three in Mount Union was the first to close in December of 1953. Uh, why is it tied into the Korean War? Well, because uh, the steel and iron production had been greatly increased 
prior to and during World War II uh, was basically stayed in place between World War II and the Korean War. But at the end of the Korean War, after the armistice, when everybody came home, uh, the, suddenly the, you know, the government is not ordering all of the munitions and equipment that they were prior to this. And so the, hence the, uh, design, the, the demand, the market for silica brick plummets. So when this happened, when General Refractories closed, the other two Mount Union refractories switched their fuel heating sources from coal to gas and oil. This thus eliminated the majority of the EBTR's traffic. Now the only thing that's going to be moving basically from this, at this point is the ganister rock going to the last two, um, last two refractories. So throughout 1954 and into 1955, the narrow gauge portion of the EBTR became a one day a week railroad, a once a week railroad. A weekly train was run on Tuesdays from Rock Hill to Robertsdale. So it would go south to Robertsdale. It would then go all the way north to Mount Union, do interchange to the Pennsylvania Railroad, go back to Rock Hill, and tie up until the following week. This was not a sustainable business model. And on November 30th, 1955, the EBTR filed a motion with the Interstate Commerce Commission to abandon the entire railroad. Following this, the Rock Hill Coal Company made the decision to shut down their remaining mines around Robertsdale in the early 1950s. This great photograph actually shows the entrance to the major mine at Robertsdale. This was a well-built mine operation. You can see it's got overhead catenary wires for the electric trains that go down into the mines, carry the miners and bring the product back. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge operation, and it is about to close. So the last narrow-gauge freight train ran on April 6, 1956. Now, the standard-gauge operations in the Mount Union area lasted a few weeks longer, but by the number, summer of 1956, the entire operation was shut down. Literally, the people that were working one by one went to work and then put down their tools and went home. This next section I call the interlude, the EBTR on life support. So the entire EBTR property was, shown, was sold to a regional scrap dealer, Nick Kowalczyk, in August of 1956. The general consensus was that the end is near, but then... Aside from the scrapping of several branch lines, including the branch line that went up to the major uh, Gannister um, uh, rock place, as well as the Shade Gap branch, for the next four years, the entire main line of the railroad from Alvin to Mount Union was allowed to sit dormant. Nobody knew what was going on, but the railroad was still there. It had not started to be scrapped. In 1960, Nick Kowalczyk was approached by civic leaders from Orbisoni and Rock Hill to ask if there, who asked him if there was any interest in firing up and running a train to celebrate the 200th centenary of settlement in the Rock Hill area. To the surprise and delight of many, the answer was yes. And on May 14th of 1960, you see this wonderful letter on East Broadtop Railroad stationary, the EBTR will run again. Celebrating the reopening of the EBTR, on August 13, 1960, Nick Kowalczyk's 16-year-old daughter Millie smashes a celebratory bottle of ginger ale over the cowcatcher of Mikado Locomotive No. 12. For the following 52 years, the EBTR operated a three-and-a-half-mile segment of the railroad from Orbisonia Station to Colgate Grove under the watchful eye of the Kowalczyk family. In 2012, the EBTR once again fell into a fitful slumber. To find out what happened to both return the railroad to life 
and provide a plan for eventual restoration of the entire property, tune into part two, the EBTR, the East Broadtop Reborn DVD coming soon. This will be a future Company Shops Railroad Club meeting, which we may not be able to broadcast since it's a DVD. But this will be part of the club archives, and we can certainly arrange to lend it out if there's interest. But my presentation is not done. I have two more uh, sections which I hope you'll find to be of interest. Postscript. Breaking down the segments of the EBTR in 2024. So we're going to look at what's left of the railroad today from Mount Union all the way to Alvin. The first segment we're going to look at is Mount Union to Augwick Creek. Mount Union is where the EBTR connected to the Pennsylvania Railroad. And as I had mentioned before, EBTR actually operated two standard gauge locomotives to facilitate en interchange with the larger PRR. From Mount Union south to Allenport, halfway towards Ogwick Creek, the railroad was dual gauge. So you could run, you could run dual gauge stuff all the way out, you know, about two miles out of town. Today, the northernmost five miles of track comprises the section of railroad that is not owned by the entity known as the East Broadtop Foundation Group, which purchased the railroad property from Ogwick Creek to Alvin in 2020 from the Kowalczyk family. Again, Mount Union, there are still areas in Mount Union that are still there, and they are still dual gauge. However, it is very difficult to find the railroad. The tracks are there. Uh, the facilities are all gone. This great shot of Mount Union Yard after the um, prior to or after the shutdown shows a standard gauge gondola here, a B&O actually, a B&O railroad standard gauge gondola on narrow gauge trucks. And you can, if you could see it, you'll see the wheels on the trucks are over here, and the car is actually staying balanced on it. It's not. I'm sure they had to be careful the way they load it. And although it's hard to see it in the photograph, one of the compromise devices is on the end here, so it can be coupled up to a narrow gauge car. These are some of the cabin cars, which were also the coaches. Um, it was interesting, after they stopped passenger service, they still continue to run the coaches for the most part because the crews found them more, pot, more comfortable than the cabin cars. This is the Mount Union engine house. Uh, these are before and after views of the EBTR's dual gauge engine house in Mount Union, which is now owned by the Mount Union Connecting Railroad. There are still a significant number of derelict EBTR narrow gauge coal hoppers parked all along the right of way between Mount Union and Ogwick Bridge. The Route 522 dual gauge crossing north of Allenport is still in place and being maintained. The Mount Union Connecting Railroad, the MUCR, was set up in 1998 to provide connections from Norfolk Southern in Mount Union to the Riverview Business Park in Allenport. And the idea was that they were going to uh, locate some railroad served uh, customers who wanted to get stuff by standard gauge railroad cars in Allenport. But while the track is still in place, this shot from recent shot from Google Earth shows the railroad to be effectively out of service. Why do I say that? Because the railroad track is kept up, uh, maybe by PennDOT, and it disappears into a clump of trees. <laughs> so the, the, M, the MUCR's track, again, ends at the north end of the Augwick Bridge, but that is not what is in service today. So in 2024, the Augwick Bridge, I, I call it the Berlin Wall of the EBTR, the original EBTR. This photograph on the left is a photograph I took in West Berlin. And this shows the, the virtual end of one of Deutschland Rail's, Deutsch, Deutsche Bahn's rail, major railroad lines into uh, East Berlin, which is actually uh, bisected by the Berlin Wall and cut off. 
Uh, can't, I was not able to, uh, nor even even on the West German side, they're very uh, particular about people approaching the walls. You can't see it, but this is the end of the railroad. It stops there. Well, you have the same thing on Ogwick Bridge. This side of the railroad going north up to uh, Mount Union, the Mount Union Connecting Railroad. This side on the south, going all the way to Alvin, is owned by the East Broadtop uh, Foundation Group. So uh, that is it. And there presently there is no regular communication between the two owners. There are no plans at this point to put together the whole railroad as a single entity from Mount Union to Alvin. However, EBTR still owns a significant portion of the railroad, basically about 28 to 29 miles. So from Ogwick Creek Bridge to Ormissonia, this includes what they call the original clay pit siding. Clay pit siding is where the EBTR people, when they decided to start up railroad service again, the excursion service, they built a thing called Colgate Grove. Colgate Grove was actually named after the Colgate family who had a far farm nearby. So what happens today is the operating part of the railroad, uh, this is the Y at Rock Hill Furnace. Here's the Orbisonia station here. Basically you go up, you can make a progressive move into Colgate Grove, you go part of the way of Clay Pit, and then the railroad, the train picks you up, goes up here, turns on the Y, takes you back to Colgate Grove. So for the past 60 years, Colgate Grove and the former Clay Pit siding has been the end of the railroad excursions from Orbisonia to Ra and Rock Hill Furnace. This is the one section of the entire railroad that is fully in service. Moving south to the EBTR shops in Rock Hill Furnace, these compromise a working industrial archaeological site. What do I mean of this? Mean about this? Okay, I want you to take a quick look at this truly 19th century, almost, you know, industrial revolution type workshop. We're going to go to the next slide. This is a 12 inch, a one foot wide leather pulley, originally operated by a steam engine. It's now operated by compressed air. This pulley turns these wheels throughout the shops. These wheels can operate every machine in this shop. The entire machine shop was operated every day. They would come in, they'd turn the big pulley on. Anybody who needed to use a, one of the uh, uh, machines on the shop, they would just turn a lever, they would connect it to the pulley, and all of a sudden the machine, whether it was a drill, uh, a saw, whatever, would suddenly come to life. It is amazing, and it all still works. So, the Rock Hill shops at Rock Hill are presently refurbishing locomotive number 15, a 2A2 Baldwin, built in 1914. Um, the engine um, working today, uh, you know, is okay for a couple of years, but like every other a steam railroad, everybody, just about anybody that's really a going concern has at least two possibly operable locomotives and usually have one working and the other one in the shop being refurbished or rebuilt. And that's the case with the East Broadtop. This is a picture of the East Broadtop Boiler Locomotive Shop at Rock Hill. And this gorgeous structure is EBTR's eight-stall roundhouse at Rock Hill Shops. And most of these stalls are filled with those wonderful Mikado, those 2A2 locomotives um, uh, that are, have been, that were saved uh, when the railroad you know, stopped doing business in 1956. Okay, so going from Rock Hill and the shops to Saltillo, 6.6 .6 miles. First of all, the EBTR Foundation Group has already started their goal of, re, of re, starting to reopen the part, of the part of the line they own. So they have actually gone and opened the railroads south to Buhur. Buhur used to be a coal mine here. Uh, this didn't make it to Kowalczyk. This was taken up kind of early when the coal, uh, coal mines. But 
The major thing down here is Pogue. So we're going to make the assumption that from Orbisonia to Pogue, this is going to probably be put into service within the next year. Okay, what is, what is significant about Pogue? Well, halfway to the town of Saltillo is the bridge over Pogue Creek. This is the longest and largest structure on the EBTR. Though the ties on the bridge have rotted and the piers need reinforcing, the basic structure still stands intact. Um, this can be put back into service. It will not be cheap, as you can imagine, but it is not like they have to rebuild the structure. And uh, so the, I guess the immediate goal is to be able to take passengers at least down to the Pogue Bridge um, on the way to Saltillo. This is the main line right away at Jordan Summit, just south of the Pogue Bridge Station, uh, Bridge and Station, south of it meaning on the way past the over Pogue Creek and going towards Saltillo. The EBT Foundation currently has enough funds to replace the track ties and ballast to this point. But this is still approximately 4.95 or 5 miles short of the town of Saltillo and some 8.7 miles from the Sidling Hill Tunnel. You will hear more about the Sidling Hill Tunnel very soon. This is the station of Saltillo before its demise, well, before, just right after the railroad stopped business and then prior to its demise. This was a staging area for southbound trains preparing to tackle the mountain grades that went from Saltillo up to the tunnels. It was also the junction for the branch line to Narco, whose Ganister Rock Quarry was the last active shipper on the EBTR. So going from Saltillo to the Sidling Hill Tunnel, and we're going to say we're going to go from Sol Sidling Hill Tunnel to Kimmel, and Kimmel is just short of the uh, tunnel. It's 3.7 miles. So it's not very far once you get to Saltillo. You are going to start climbing. You're going to start climbing. You're going to make a real sharp curve and you're going to go really up climbing up to the next tunnel. So we're coming to what I call a tail of two tunnels. Sidling Hill Tunnel to Rays Hill Tunnel. This is Sidling Hill on the left, Rays Hill on the right. Sidling Hill Tunnel is a curved tunnel that runs a total distance of 830 feet. Because winter winds would freeze the water that accumulates on the tunnel floor, the EBTR employed two watchmen, one at either end, to close the two large wooden doors and both ends of the tunnel. Eventually the watchmen were replaced by devices similar to automatic garage door openers at both ends. The train would pull up the brakeman would get out, he would actually pull a cord that would activate the garage door thing. It would kind of let a uh, steel door uh, roll up like a garage door, and they would come in that way, go in or out that way. This dramatic photograph by the uh, photographer Phil Hastings shows a northbound train entering the south entrance of Sidling Hill Tunnel. Because it was drilled through solid rock, the company did not erect a concrete portal here. This thing looks like you're going into a cave. If anybody's ever been to the National the Natural Tunnel up in Virginia, this is what it's like for the NS trains today to go into it. You know, it just you're just going into a into a, a hole in the rock. This view shows a northbound train entering the north entrance of Sidling Hill Tunnel. This was more built up. Isn't this a wonderful photograph? And you can see how tight the clearance was. You think, gosh, boy, that just barely uh, you know, covers the uh, stack. But because of the need to protect the tunnel from winter weather, a roll-up door was also installed here. This is Sidling Hill Tunnel shown in, 19, in 2022 when a drone, team, a, do, a drone team mapped the interior. They invited Trains Magazine to come down. And these are some photographs from the train's news wire. This shows the entrance to the Sidling Hill Tunnel. 
the, uh, the south entrance, and this shows the north entrance. And although you really can't see it, the rolled up garage door, which has since fallen off its hinges and onto the ground is here. Um, uh, I am happy to report that in both cases where they did the drone, they were able to get the drones uh, through the tunnel. Um, but, you know, so it is possible to get through the tunnel, but there's going to be a lot of reinforcement work and a lot of safety stuff to be done before they'll ever, they, set, they start sending crews in there to rebuild this tunnel. So from Sidling Hill Tunnel or Kimmel to Rays Hill Tunnel or the town of Coles is 2.7 miles. Okay, what's interesting about Coles is that there was actually a branch line that stopped just short of the Rays Hill Tunnel, the next tunnel we're going to go through, and, it, and actually kind of went up onto a plateau. The whole right-of-way is still there. And I, I think it's fair to say that one of the midterm goals of the EBTR Foundation, again, we're probably talking decades, is to restore the railroad to just short of Rays Hill Tunnel, take it up to a place called Joller or Joller, turn the train on the Y there, let people picnic, not unlike the operation at Cath today. Return to Orbisonia. This drawing by the artist J. Craig Thorpe shows an empty southbound train climbing around Mule's Shoe Curve on, at Coles. Coles was mile post 24-23. Coles is a little less than two miles from Rays Hill Tunnel. And this is where the former branch line to Joller uh, diverged north. Why was it called Mule's Shoe Tunnel Curve? I, I'm not sure, but I know for a fact that Horseshoe Curve had already been developed by the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, hence maybe the smaller Muleshoe Curve uh, as kind of a copycat name. The single greatest obstacle to restoring the entire EBTR, Rays Hill Tunnel, is a straight line tunnel that rolls in total distance of 1,138 feet. Like the Sidling Hill Tunnel, it had automatic roll-up door at the west portal, which we're kind of looking into here. So while both tunnels have been subject to partial roof collapses and cave-ins, Rays Hill Tunnel is especially vulnerable as its roof has been weakened by the coal deposits that exist above the tunnel roof. Uh, the, coal, the coal is a softer rock and this makes the structure less stable. So part of it is actually lined but and again they were able to get the drone all the way through here. Um, my thought is if they ever get around to reopening this this would probably make a delightful Halloween train ride but uh, uh, who knows. Okay from Rays Hill Tunnel down to Alvin and Robertsdale seven miles, six and a half miles, going south. Okay, nothing of too much interest other than I, I understand it's very scenic. Because of the expense in rehabilitating the Rays Hill Tunnel, the line from Rays Hill to Robertsdale is the least likely to be reopened in my lifetime. This photograph from the early 1950s shows a fan trip that ran to the literal end of the railroad just south of Alvin. <laughs> it was, there was nothing down there. In fact, what they normally did when they went down there is the, rail, <coughs> the engine came out. The engine just pushed empty cars down there. They just left them down there. They came over. They loaded the cars. The engine came down and pulled them back to Robertsdale. They would switch them in the yard there. But in 2024, a mile of the line from Robertsdale south to Alvin has been rehabilitated enough to use, allow the use of rail bikes which can be rented in the summer and the fall. And you'll see these four gentlemen are having a delightful time, uh, you know, pedaling their little rail cart uh, through there. There is also a rail bike operation now in North Carolina, which the Company Shops Railroad Club is hoping to take a field trip to. Um, that one goes up a much steeper grade and actually has a small electric motor in the back of it. 
So if the uh, folks in the, comp in the club are not quite up to doing the pedaling all the way, you can have the electric motor kick in. All right, the last chapter, the other railroad at Rock Hill Furnace. Railways to Yesterday or the Rock Hill Trolley Museum. The EBTR Shade Gap, Gap Branch became redundant after iron ore shipments from Nancy dried up. Isn't that a great name, Nancy? It doesn't show here, but that was actually where the big iron ore mines were. Uh, I suspect that the explorer or the gentleman of the gentleman who owned the uh, iron ore mines either named him after his wife, daughter, or girlfriend. So, but when the Rock Hill Furnaces closed in 1907, Nancy became this. By the way, this is a delightful view of uh, Shade Gap. It is a very bucolic place, and the train coming in, if it were to come in this day, I suspect that whoever was on the bottom of the totem pole of the crew in there, uh, the, the break with the least seniority, was the one that was set up there to shoo this bull off the tracks. In 1948, the Shade Gap branch was cut back to the Highway 522 grade crossing at Black Log. And that point then served as a staging area to scrap the remainder of the line from Black Log to Shade Gap. When the EBTR stopped doing business in 1956, the part of the line that was still in place from Black Log to Shade Gap was pulled up almost immediately. In 1960, after the EBTR had been shut down for five years and separate from the earlier uh, approach by uh, the group to run a steam train again, Kowalczyk, Nick Kowalczyk, the owner, was, had made a proposition to a group of trolley enthusiasts who had approached him about running their Johnstown, Pennsylvania streetcar. You can rebuild the former Shade Gap branch from Rock Hill Furnace to Black Log at your own expense, and you can run on it. The group then organized as the Rock Hill Trolley Museum took Kowalczyk up on his offer and relayed the track, erecting over higher cantonary poles from Rock Hill to Black Log Narrows. This is the literal end of the line. This is York Railways, Brill Car number 163, probably built in the 1920s, early 30s, um, arriving at the end of the line. You can barely see US 522, which is the main uh, highway corridor from Mount Union to Orbisoni and then south to the Pennsylvania Turnpike is over here. I am basically standing on the right-of-way of 522, uh, making sure that I don't get hit by cars. So, I am now going to give you a summary of the whole railroad from Mount Union. Hopefully, looking at the map here will maybe help it make a little bit more sense rather than just seeing the individual pieces. So first off, we have Mount Union to Ogwick Bridge to Colgate Grove. Again, this is all out of service with no plans for a connection or rehabilitation at present. Approximately 7.5 miles. And old Colgate Grove is basically here just south of Shirleysburg. From Colgate Grove to Orbisonia, this is the red area here. This has been part, this is fully opened, has scheduled service. If you go up on it this May, this is what you're going to get a ride on. You may actually get a little bit of a ride going further south towards Pogue Bridge, but not all the way there. Excuse me, I apologize. I'm jumping the gun here. Or a Colgate Grove to Orbisonia is right here. And that's the, is the open part. Pogue Bridge to Saltillo is the next section to be rehabilitated. As I mentioned, a, a mile or two of this actually has been reopened. Uh, they can run a train south from there and have done it on occasion. So this will be the next section of the railroad to, to open. So you should, in theory, you'll be able to ride from Shirleysburg all the way to, um, all the way to the edge of the Pogue Bridge. From Pogue Bridge to Saltillo, including the, air, the area through Sp Three Springs, which is another town which is not a ghost town, still an existing town. It is out of service, but this will be the section of the railroad that is rehabilitated next, 3.575 miles. 
I'm sorry, 5.25 miles. Saltillo to up the curve and then down to that very sharp area, to Sidling Hill Tunnel. Out of service, but the, but the, and the next following section for rehabilitation, 3.75 miles. Then Sidling Hill Tunnel right here, Rays Hill Tunnel here, you're basically going up one mountain gap, going down a, a slight engage and going up another mountain and then dropping down into Robertsdale. Out of service, 2.7 miles. Long-term plan is to extend service under the former Jaller branch. This will require opening from Sidling Hill Tunnel to Coles. But again, still a good ways off. Then Rays Hill down to Robertsdale, out of service, uh, five miles, and probably not in any big hurry to, uh, to reopen it unless they ever start to run regular excursions out of, Rock, out of Robertsdale. And then, as I mentioned, part of the railroad from Robertsdale south to Alvin has been partially put back in service, but just for railroad bikes. So that is the end of my presentation. Uh, if you were with me in person, you'd be asking me questions, but I will go ahead and just jump ahead to some of the sources that I used to uh, put this together. This, by the way, is a picture of the excursion train at the Colgate Grove picnic area. Thank you all very much uh, for your uh, patience during this. I hope you've enjoyed it, and I also really sincerely hope that you will consider taking a trip up to Orbisonia and looking at this true marvel of a, uh, of a railroad. It is a good day's trip up there. It is well worth it. So again, thank you.